Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Accounting Insiders podcast. My name is Gary Dehart. I'm the publisher of Insightful Accountant and the host of the Accounting Insiders podcast. And today, my guest is Al Wagner, the COO and co-founder of Wholesale Payroll. Al, welcome. Thanks for taking some time to, uh, to hop on and talk about payroll. Yeah, my pleasure. I think I might have a little bit of a passion for it. Talk to me. Why is that? What's your, what's your background that drives you for passion for payroll? Well, thanks for asking that. And in a nutshell, I graduated from Penn State University oh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away and stayed away from, well, I went into the, the public accounting field and then ended up opening up my own shop back in the 90s and stayed away from payroll, Garrick, because it was just an area that historically wasn't very profitable for CPAs to do because we've got to charge our billing rates, even, even in today's environment with bookkeepers and the way that that's all gone. It's, it can be really hard to compete with the bigger firms. Well, about 2006, I found a product that was produced by some guys that left into it, actually, and they formed this company called PayCycle. And I figured out back in 2006 how I could create a profitable payroll service leveraging that tech. And now what, 17, just about 17 years later, here I am and we've now um, been doing payroll for that long and sold everything else in 2015. I'm a former CPA, Been was that for 94 through 2020. So okay. that 20, just about 26 years. All right. Um, started that in Pennsylvania and then moved to South Florida and love it down here. Got to tell you, if you got to, if you got to do anything anywhere, South Florida is not a bad place to be. Why not do it in South Florida? What's the, what is the weather in South Florida? I'm in Georgia and it is overcast and rainy on and off. So the blue sky in the background here is about the blue sky that's out there. <laughs> and where are puppy clouds. <laughs> where, where are you actually? Marco? Is that right? Mark Weiland, so Mark Weiland. Uh, just south of Naples. Yeah, which I've I've not I've I've been down to South Florida, been over to Miami, been across Alligator Alley. So I've seen, I guess, the streets and exits to to get there, but I've never been there. I hear it's really nice. First drinks on me. All right. Isn't that where um that's where Rush Limbaugh was, right? Wasn't he on Marco Island or Naples? Uh Boehner was here for a while. Uh, Tom Cruise's mom had a place here. Um, there's a number of country singers that have been here. They come and go. Uh, it's a yeah. pretty oh. sleepy town. Actually, no, I think it might be a guy who used to be on the radio here, Neil Bort. Oh. I think he might be. Oh, yeah. Yes, I know the name. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so well, there we go. That's that's the yeah. closest I've gotten to uh, to Marco Island. But maybe one day, put it on my list. One day. You drive over the bridge and you, it just feels like home. It's nice. Yeah. And you've been there how long? 19 years. Okay. Originally from the Philadelphia area. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Probably a little bit, a little bit of difference in Philly and Marco, I imagine. Um, Marco Island. So I was just back in Philly this past weekend, had to go yeah. to Syracuse, New York. And let me tell you what, I don't miss that area whatsoever. No. At all. Not even a little. <laughs> no. And so nothing, uh, nothing to offend anyone that's listening. That's, uh, you know, we all have our own preferences. Hey, so. listen, everybody's got to take one for the team and anybody that's not around here, I appreciate it. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> there you go. Right. <laughs> Helps your traffic. So, all right. So let's talk about payroll. It's funny as, as we were in the green room, so to speak, talking about this and when we had our, our pre-call uh, last week or so, um, one thing that keeps coming to mind for me is why wouldn't accountants do this? And because when you look at some of the bigger companies that are out there, certainly one of the biggest ADP, I think, is privately held, right? Privately held. Uh, no, they're public. They're not? Okay. Um, so, you yeah, know, and they're massive. And they're massive because they're in payroll. So there's and so there's got to be something in payroll. Somebody's making money at it. So why shouldn't accountants make money? I'm getting a little ahead of ourselves in our conversation. But, but if you could, give a little history perspective on accountants and payroll. What, uh, what I imagine is a love-hate relationship. Oh, that's well said, because that's exactly how I started out, right? And in the 90s, as, as a kind of a young, fresh CPA, and then even entering in my own firm, like payroll is one of those things that's just monotonous, tedious, got to get it right, it's got to mm -hmm. be timely. And so that, that puts a strain on a firm, whether you're one to 500 in, in staff, even those dedicated people to it, 
you've got to pay attention to. It's not quite like doing the books where you might have a couple of days or even a, a yeah, a couple of days, a couple of weeks to actually get that done where you've got to just be right on top of it. Then to add on onto that as a an accountant, bookkeeper, or a CPA enrolled agent, whatever your flavor is in the yeah. industry, competing with somebody like ADP who does focus, right? The three largest players in the market today remain ADP. Paychex has slipped. They're now third. Intuit with their QuickBooks product has uh, risen into second place. But between really? those, three, that. Okay. yeah, they did two, three years ago, I think now. Um, to compete with those guys, it's really difficult to do that as an independent or as a firm where you have to add on a billing rate on top of that, mm -hmm. right? Because everything's time and material. Even if you're doing flat fee arrangements, you're still accounting for your time in those models. So how do you compete with ADP paychecks who can outsource a good chunk of that, particularly nowadays, to foreign countries with a lot cheaper labor rates yet still charge American rates? Right. It's it it is it becomes um, a barrier to providing that service because their employers, the client, can go direct, right? And they can get the same or same service for less money than what an accountant could normally charge. Hmm. That's that's historically that's been the biggest impediment, um, at least in in my 25 plus years of of being in this space. That's what I see more times than not between the, the cost comparison and the um, um, time commitment that's necessary. That's why I think you see, well, I'll give you the statistic. There's about 312,000 of us in the country that are in the accounting space, according to Ibis World, okay. an industry report, right? It is a only about 144, 145,000 that, that actually are in the payroll space itself. So less than half, which is very interesting to me, right? Because to your point, there's money to be made. Right. And a lot of money to be made. You said less than half, but then there was also something else. I don't know if we talked about it or if, if I read it somewhere um, about the percentage of companies that do payroll in-house versus out of house. Sure. We were talking about that in the green room and okay. the, the National Association of Small Business kind of tracks that in their questionnaires that go out to small business, small, medium sized business. So about the eight million or so that are in the United States, 60 percent roughly still do their payroll in house. They do it there on their own using leveraging some kind of software, mostly only 40 percent outsource it. Right. OK. Yeah. I mean, which kind of lumps into the advisory conversation, right? I mean, payroll yes. to me, and it, we've, we're on our third accountant and for each one, I mean, we've always said, I want you to do just everything. I don't, everything. You know, anything that I don't have to do that you can do, I want you to do that. And if it's working well, it's in my best interest, right? Because they, yep. they've got everything right there. It gets done versus, you know, do I do this or do I do that? Uh, you know, and it doesn't distract me from from running my own business. So, um, so I, so it just seems to me it, that payroll is almost a must-have offering for an accounting firm. I I get the perspective, uh, and I would experience and history shows that it is definitely not right. where the accountant goes. Is say we'll leverage some other software. You'll subscribe to it, client, and mm. yeah, I'll go in and I, I can help facilitate it and maybe reconcile it. But again, it's the billing rate that comes on top of that that the client then doesn't want to pay. Right. And, and now you have a cost benefit ratio. You know, that, that's what the client's doing going now nah, I'll do it myself or, you know, just check over my shoulder, make sure it's okay. Yep. So what have you seen? What are the trends you're seeing? Um, let's just say oh. in the five to 10 years, or, or even if there's bigger trends in the shorter period? Um, that is a great question. And it is the very reason we are where we are today in terms of our company. The trend as I've seen it. So I'm gonna use a phrase coming from a PhD consultant that I've had for a number of years now who 
describes this as what's called a balanced feedback loop. We as accountants are so used, and we like it, right? We're so used to doing things in a very particular way, using the same kind of tools. We can, we can anticipate the results. There's not a lot of wiggle room in things. To that degree, though, the, the big com the competitors, the ADPs, paychecks, even Gusto, and some of the other players that are out here are taking advantage of that mindset. And what I mean by that, Gary, is the trend is we're going to strip away the professional's ability to perform services for their client in favor of going to a, a affiliate commission style where those companies are going to provide the support because there's a lot of profit margin for them in that environment. And again, like I said earlier, because they can outsource and get a lot cheaper labor outside of the United States, and they go head to head with the professional in the space. So I don't care if you're charging 25 bucks an hour because you're a bookkeeper in the middle of nowhere, or you're in LA and you're able to get 145 to 175 an hour as a bookkeeper, forget the CPAs and everything else. That's the competition that now exists. And so the shift, this trend is for those guys, those big players to come directly after clients. And, and I'll add to that, when we look at those bigger players, Gary, and this is where it becomes extremely difficult for the professional in the space to remain competitive and have a profit margin, they offer ancillary services that maybe the smaller player can't, such as 401k, such mm -hmm. as time clocks, such as other tools and functions and features that they don't make available as a as a profit model for the for the practitioner. They're going after the insurances, right? They're going after the retirement benefits. They're going after the uh, insurances, not not just health insurance. They go after the workers' comp. They go after the the liability. They have expanded their variety of services so that they can attempt to be a one stop shop, but there's always a catch. At least in my opinion. Right. You can be a master of, try to be a master of all or a jack of all trades and a master of none. I think that's the, the, the second part of the trend that we see where these companies are out there trying to create a bunch more verticals and they kind of leave. And I know the undertone that I've really been witness to over the last two years is the, dis, the level of dissatisfaction that exists in this space towards the players, the big players. Everybody that I've really talked to feels extremely disenfranchised and let down. The folks who built these companies, the folks that built ADP for them, the folks that built Paychex and Intuit, we're now being left by the wayside, right? Because we're all the folks that referred them. Client, you've got to use this software. And now, 20, 30 years later, and particularly in the last five years, and even for one particular company in the last two years, they've eliminated our, our options to even offer services and increased fees hmm. exponentially. Not just even a couple percent, it's, it's become exponential. So with, so, so you've got competition, both you know, or horizontally, I would call it, like within other accounting right. firms, with other accounting firms, and you're saying you've got competition, or not you, but accounting firms have competition coming from the, the major, you know, the large providers of the services. Um, but I think we, we both have said and certainly agree that, well, in my opinion, I think you agreed with this, but, you know, it's a must have in an advisory approach for an accountant working with their clients. Uh, that full service capability is what, again, I as a small business owner, it's what I, I have to have. I, I don't want to say I demand it, you know, it's not that, but you know, when we looked at changing firms, that's what we looked at. You have to, if you can't offer that full service capability, then you're not right for me. And I think, right. and, and I think more small business owners want that. I, I want to know that everything's going to get done. It's going to get done in a timely manner. And, you know, people are going to get paid in a timely manner. And, you know, within the guidelines set by the state, federal government, whoever it is that regulates. So 
So what does that look like? Let's let's pivot a little bit and go from, um, you know, I think you had said before that, you know, there's this big group that have said, yep, I embrace it. There's a big group that says, no way, never. And then there's the group that's like, yeah, maybe if it was, you know, if it was easier or if I had the staff or if it was, um, you know, if I was convinced it was a way to help me grow my business by helping my clients, which I think it's number three. So you grow your business by helping your clients. So what does that look like? How does, so let's just say right now I'm a fence sitter and I'm thinking, all right, I think I do need to get involved in payroll. Talk to enough of my peers who are involved in payroll and they're doing okay with it. How do I get involved with it? What's my, what are my options? Obviously there's, I don't want to say obviously, but there's, there's multiple routes people can go, right? And you mentioned sure. ADP. When you can go from an ADP that has a gazillion things in the, in the toolkit, um, you can go to you know wholesale payroll, which is I I imagine this is me putting words in your mouth, but uh, you know a very hands-on type of service. Um, but so how does how do I get involved in payroll if if I want to take my practice that direction? Sure, uh, and I want to take a quick step back to agree with you that I believe firms do need to have this type of service. They have to have that all-encompassing approach because I think that's what people are starting to look for again. I think everything cycles and I think we're, we're approaching, I think the pendulum's going back to that direction where more people are just like you saying, I want you to do my taxes, I want you to do my books and I also need you to do my payroll. Help me with my insurance and evaluate different things so you can actually become a consultant inside so you have all of these facilities at your disposal inside of a one-stop shop. And so to your point of the fence sitters, it's, it really starts to come down to how am I going to deliver that service? Can I make a profit at that service? Do I have the resources to provide a payroll service? Can I scale that? Is this just kind of a, a loss leader or is this actually a nice revenue profit center for my, for my firm? And over the course of the last 17 years, I've absolutely proven that it, it should be and can be, and given the right attention and the right structure, will be a profit center and not just a small one. So it really ought to be a six-figure part of any firm's business. And in order to enter into that space and to really evaluate, so I would, I, I'll expand going from the, the kind of the fence sitters and even the ones that are in the business. What's that structure look like? What are the challenges that you face? How have you modeled your business? so that you can actually scale it to a point where you are generating six figures. It's a little bit more about my background in this and why I decided to, to even get into the space itself. I come from um, looking for side hustles 20 years ago, got involved in Amway. Now I might be dating myself because most people don't even hear about Amway anymore, right? <laughs> hey, I I know did a friend. I've got some friends. Right, and what I liked about what I saw there was that duplication model. Yeah, and all the franchises do that. And I thought, well, that's today's subscription model. And when we see that in software, that's nothing more than a duplication model. So let's sign this person up, this person up, and we just get this recurring revenue. And depending on the level of service, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about where Wholesale Payroll, how that came about in terms of what, what a practitioner can do, and particularly compared to somebody like an ADP. How involved will you get with your clients? Will you educate your clients so that they can actually take over and do these things on their own so that you can be more like an ADP? Or do you want to be, uh, there's a gentleman in Naples about 30 minutes away. He's, he's a tax practitioner and he is extremely white glove, very exclusive, charges a lot, and he delivers the service that that particular niche of client wants. So you Really, I think it comes down to what's the business philosophy of that fence sitter? And do you want to be all things to your client? And if not, are you leaving yourself vulnerable to a competitor coming in and going, we do all of this and look at these tools that we have to, to, for you to use and make that all cost efficient? And so, um, so you really caught my attention when you said $100,000 in 
in payroll. Um, is that my top line or is that my bottom line? Well, I've talked with thousands of folks over the course of my career. Everybody's got a much different threshold. So I use the 100,000. I've done that. I've, I've created a six-figure business out of, out of payroll. Mm -hmm. Not everybody thinks in that term. Could you have a seven-figure? Yeah, I know how to model that too. My, my other firm has not reached that yet, yet. Um, and there's there have been some roadblocks to that, but we're about to destroy all those so that we can actually get to a seven figure and really be competitive in the space. So it really depends, Gary, on the level of somebody's vision. How how broad and vast and deep can somebody dream as to the size of the nature of the business they want? Yeah. So is it so when you're structuring it? Is the and, and I'm coming in totally ignorant on payroll other than I like to make sure, sure. I get paid, right? Um, and and that it's done right. Is it seems so it's it, you, so you're relying pretty heavily on the software to make sure it's 100 make sure it's done right, but right. there's work has to be done on the front end that has to be done right. Um but it seems once that, again, let's say I came to you and said, hey, you know, I'm, I want to open a payroll service. Um, once I have the flow and the understanding of what the requirements are, you probably have a checklist. Make, make sure you have this, that, and the other thing. Um, it seems like it's very scalable very quickly without a lot of investment. Really interesting observation there. and. The short answer is yes, I think you're right. It's a minimum, it can be a minimal investment depending on the how you want to deliver that service. And to your point, data in, you know, right? Garbage in, garbage out, bad data in, bad data out. So, yes, you have to have that mm, uh, crossing the T's, dot in the I's kind of mental attitude to, if you're going to offer a more of a white glove service. What we tend to do or what I tend to really try to educate other practitioners on is yeah, save those for your you know your special clients that kind of level of of service where the majority if you're in the bell curve 10 percent on the bottom 10 percent on the top and that 80 in the middle you really want to educate them on how they can leverage the tools at at their disposal through you in order to actually do the lion's share of the work that's where the scalability comes into play and so now you got to look at the different softwares that are available that can actually perform the work and have to make sure even the big players get it wrong. And mm -hmm. their calculations don't necessarily always come together right. The availability of the platform isn't necessarily always there. What's the level of customer support you're going to be able to receive given the nature of the model that they provide? Um, I, I don't want to segue into that where, where I think practitioners need to evaluate. So there's kind of two segments to how you can deliver that. You can do um, a, what I'll call a leverage service, such as what wholesale payroll does bring to the table, as well as ADP and paychecks and, and into it, right? Where they, um, you're acquiring a complete software package and you don't really have to do any type of maintenance. And there's other providers like iSoft is an interesting option. Um, and there's a couple others that are out there. There's about 500 or so uh, companies in the space, in which we make up one of them. The, the other piece is, well, sure, we're going to give you the software components. You have to build up your database. You have to build, you have to have some IT department of some type that's going to be able to manage that solution for you. And whether that's white labeled or, or, or not, those are the, basically the two types of levels of service that you can do. One very techie, one that's not, that's more plug and play. So understanding what, you're, what you want to do with that uh, really can dictate. And so I sit in the middle. I was, that, I was one of those guys that said, okay, I, I want to be able to provide a, a service that can be scaled that I don't, I'm not an IT guy. We're in the software space, but don't ask me to code you anything because right. it won't work. I, I can certainly write something um, and that in five bucks and you can get a small copy of that Starbucks. Exactly. <laughs> um, and 
so it, it comes down to really, at least in my opinion, what is the brand that you want to deliver into your marketplace? Are you are you the white glove? Are you the, the hands off? And that's really going to dictate how you structure everything else in terms of payroll service offering. I love numbers. I love volume. I don't like that. Um, what's that concentration of risk, right? So if we're if anybody that listens to this as CPA and they're doing audits, they know they have a con concentration of risk disclosure. I don't like when one or a handful of customers can really dictate the outcomes of my own business. Conversely, I also don't like if a vendor has that potential. I personally have experienced a vendor stealing what, what I consider stealing my business from out from underneath of me. Mm. I'm not a fan of that. Yeah. If, they're, if they're the client of my firm or they're the client of a listener's firm, as that practitioner, that client's information, data, relationship is between the practitioner and the client. I would not agree. the people that provide the software for crying out loud. Right. Right. So that's a that's a whole nother issue that's in the mindset, in that trend that's going on. The providers of most of this software are looking at the practitioner's clients as theirs. Hmm. They're a subscriber to the tool. I get that. So in that sense, yeah, they're they're a client. But that data, that relationship is not between the software company and the client. It's between the practitioner and the client. And right. they're just how, how you, right? So that's a whole nother evaluation that I think practitioners really need to take a look at and look at history. What are the folks doing that you're thinking about aligning with? And do you have a concentration of risk that they can absolutely destroy your business overnight? Right, yeah. That's a really good point. What about um, what are some of the some of the pitfalls and and you know things to avoid as someone again a, a fence sitter is considering with payroll? Like, what are the, there's got to be a top two or three things that will you know if you don't get this right, you're out of business and the government's knocking on your door. I mean, it it comes down to the human capital element. It, how are you going to service to the client, regardless of the tool that you're using? Okay. Are you going to dedicate the necessary time, whether it's training them or being available to them? That's going to be the number one, in my opinion, the number one pitfall. Because you want to go on vacation. You want to be able to take a day off. The minute you do offer payroll, you do have to account for that. Because people are going to rely upon you in order to get those paychecks out the door. And or make sure that the paychecks that are in process are getting out the door, whether they're automated or non-automated. They're still relying on you when there is a problem and you're not around. You've lost a client. Yeah. And, and, and you, they may come after you for penalties, interest and everything. Else. Case in point of the government knocking on your door. So I'd say that's probably the largest concern. I think anybody, any practitioner still has to worry about it, particularly tax season and all the rest. Payroll, though. Weekly payrolls, yeah, you, you got to make sure that your systems can provide the service and still have time for yourself to go on vacation. Right. Or an afternoon <laughs> off, right? Or if you just yeah. go networking. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. Just, yeah. How about if I can just go to lunch? That would be nice. And yes. Uh, okay. And is the place to start? All right. So I've decided I'm off the fence, I'm in the payroll. Number one thing I've got to worry about is make sure I have it staffed appropriately internally. Um, what would number two be? What's your business model going to be to create a profit margin that makes sense for the staff that you need? Now, to that degree, Gary, I, I've been in by myself servicing over 300 clients every month. Uh, the average, when you look in the industry, the average firm is going to have about 35, 36. And that average size is going to be about 10 employees. Okay. So put that kind of in your mind and go, okay, what kind of cost structure 
am I am I going to have, and can I create profitability around that size? So now I've got to scale that. And so first consideration is is staffing. So am I going to do all the work? Am I a sole practitioner? Can I actually do this? Do I have a tool that I can scale and leverage and 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 create this average firm of 35, 36 employer clients? And can I get it to over a hundred? That's where it starts to get exciting, is when you hit that hundred mark and and you actually start to see some nice profit coming depending on the tool that's being leveraged. Right. That, so that was kind of a, a little bit, maybe an ambiguous number two, um, yeah. but it's really the structure, I think, um, making sure you have the staff and or the time yourself to do it. Yeah. And then the, the structure of, of how you're going to do it. Okay. Do you have a number three? Is there a number three that you would go, hey, you got to make sure you have this checked off? Not really. Okay. As I'm looking at my own list, Gary, I'm going, no, you know, the structure is really it right there. <laughs> yeah, That's structure. Well, and, and, and maybe it, um, marketing as well, right? I mean, that that's probably Good part point. of the structure, but um, even, if you, even if you're saying, hey, you know, I'm getting into payroll, I have you know, 85 clients or whatever number that is, and um, I'm going to get into payroll, I'm only going to serve my existing client base, so you kind of have to back into that, right? Okay, do I have the time to do that? Do I have, does it, you know, monetarily, does it make sense for me to do this? And, you know, or maybe it's part of your three-year plan where in three years, you're going to double that book of business and it's all going to be based on bringing in new payroll clients. I mean, there, there's, I think it's structure and where you're trying to get to and how it fits into your business. It's a, so in terms of experience, personal experience, in the early days, I was I was a a jack of all, um, leveraging a somebody else's product that was sold exclusively to other accountants, um, and they they did go on a wholesale level, and then they did compete at a retail level. However, what I what I recognized then is if I'm I can't actually align for payroll with other accountants for two reasons. One, I could compete and steal business from them for the other services that they're providing. And um, that was the first one. I ran into that a lot. So, and the reason I'm bringing that up is just as a consideration for a practitioner that maybe not is not providing payroll services right now depending on what you leverage as your tool, you can either be perceived as competing with folks that would be great referral sources because the way to build the business goes back to what your, what your observation was is marketing and, and lead gen is really an important aspect to being able to grow a business. I built it through word of mouth, mostly through word of mouth and, and networking and, and referrals. Right. So finding those right referral partners. It's the same people who are pretty much sending you the tax work. Not necessarily the same people that are sending you the book work because plenty of tax professionals don't do the books. They send it out to a bookkeeper. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are, to your point, yeah, it's a really good good observation and something that everyone needs to consider as they're jumping off the fence. How am I going to attract that business? So, uh, so let's dive in, take about five minutes, then we'll wrap it up just on, on wholesale payroll itself and like the company, the solution. Um, yeah. and, and so you still currently personally have payroll clients. I personally do. So I started off in the business in 2006 yeah. uh, in the payroll space and reformed the company into what's known now today as, as true payroll and operates in about 24 states. Okay. The the history here and where wholesale payroll, and this is for me the most important element of why we even exist today. As a practitioner in the space and dealing with hundreds of clients every month, getting payrolls out the door, we deliver, we do you know hard checks and we educate our clients and all the rest of that stuff. The challenge that I was faced with, which everyone that is thinking about the space being in payroll or in payroll is dealing with this. The folks that we get the software solutions from are competing with us and they're shifting their, their business models 
and I mentioned a couple times now today, away from allowing us as practitioners to really deliver a quality product. They are taking that space over. So I was forced, Gary, to find a different solution and I couldn't, couldn't find it. There wasn't a solution that allowed me to do editing of my client's histories. There mm -hmm. was, there was, I did not have the ability to do something that was previously filed and go back and fix it and get refiled forms done. There wasn't, a, there's not an ability. Some of these platforms today, it takes you days and weeks to get bank account information updated. And that client, if that client's got a hacked bank account and you need to get that changed immediately, good luck. No. The support structures that are now inherent in these systems makes it near impossible. I can tell you, we lost 10% of our client base this year. Thankfully, we've regained it back. So we were at a zero, a zero growth, zero loss rate. But the fact that that's going on in the industry, we provided a solution. It's like, okay, guys, how are we going to solve these types of issues? We've got to empower the practitioner, me. So selfishly, this is built and here today developed because I wanted something. Right. And I needed something because, you know, it's either you sell of that kind of book of business to somebody else or you got to figure out some kind of solution. And so the approach that wholesale payroll takes is the practitioner's client is their client. The practitioner's client's data is their data. Mm -hmm. We make it easy to come in. We make it easy to leave. And we do that because we feel like we've got to earn every practitioner's business day in, day out, month in, month out. So we created tools and features to allow the practitioner the ability to determine exactly how they want to run their business. All we are is the hammer in the toolbox. The hammer doesn't tell the carpenter how to build the staircase. It's just there to help facilitate getting that staircase done as best as possible. So that's what we've done. We've created a platform that allows that practitioner to do soup to nuts, everything they want to do with all of the bells and whistles that the current platforms have with automations and tax filings and recalculations and, uh, and whatnot. And we've done that at a price point that I don't know of another platform that beats that, that price. It allows the practitioner to scale and grow and because that's what I'm still trying to do with right. my other with the other firm. So we're boots on the ground. What what makes us different? There's a lot of lot of things that and I've got a list of them actually that I wrote out um, before even uh, from our last call to, to today. Yeah. And I, I think there's a couple things that make it really, really interesting for a practitioner today to think about even making a switch to any other platform, whether you're going from ADP to Paychex or, or Gusto to QuickBooks, how is the information going to get from one system to another? And why is that relevant? If I, I take a little sidestep here, here in Florida, we had what that little oil spill out in the Gulf, right? Deep water. Yep. That created a whole industry around salvaging people's businesses and the lawsuit that ensued and whatnot. When people make changes in their payroll companies, typically you lose the history. If you haven't printed it out or you haven't saved it in some format, you lose it. Mm -hmm. And if something were to happen, the ERTC credits, right, With because of COVID, if somebody switched their payroll service midstream, try going back to ADP, try going back to QuickBooks is a little bit better at it, um, but try going back to Paychex or some of these other providers and go, oh, I need six months ago, I, I need that history. Sorry, we, we can't help you, it's gone. Hmm. Have to take in, into consideration the continuity, the preservation of your client's data. What does wholesale payroll do? From whatever platform somebody's coming from, we have, we have a few that are already lined up. We can extract that, that data essentially overnight. So the migration process, one of the barriers to entry into the space is being able to migrate customers. And I don't care again, whether what platform you're going to or from, that should be a consideration. What's gonna to happen to the continuity of the history of your client 
when you either you make a switch or you decide to get into the space. We've solved that problem because I had to solve that problem. I've got clients from 2007 that are still clients today. Can't lose that history. Right. So we had to solve that problem. And I'll end with this as far as wholesale payroll and, and, and why. I didn't want to have a vendor that was competing for my client. It's actually in our service level agreements. We don't allow employers to become subscribers. You have to be a professional in the space and that's required. You have to be a reseller of the product. Yes, you can use it yourself for your own firm, but you, you, you have to be a reseller and you have to be in the space professionally in order to, to even become a subscriber. Okay. We will never, ever, I'm not going to compete with myself. Make sense? Right. Yeah. 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 Makes a lot of sense. I, I, I can't name another one that does that right now. So the uh, as we wrap up, um, where will you be? We're kind of starting to kick into, into trade show season. What? Uh, where can people yeah. find you physically? And then where can they find you online? And then we'll wrap it. Sure. Well, physically, come on down to Marco Island. Visit. We'll be. I'll be happy to go out and get a cocktail or a coffee, yeah. whatever whatever floats your boat. Uh, we're going to the Scaling New Heights Conference in St. Louis at the end of June. Really yeah. looking forward to that. We've got some exciting stuff going on there. Um, and actually, that's the our our bot here is our little preview of what we're uh, what we're doing there. And then online, it's at wholesalepayroll.com. Okay, fantastic. Then uh, it, when I get there, if I go to Wholesale Payroll, what will I find? Are there, do you have any kind of like videos, demos, or um, what, yes, what will actually, I see when I get there? Okay. So what's very interesting, and uh, it'll be a, it's a running joke around here. I'm going to use the word Kubernetes. It's a technical term in the, in the development space. Um, we're deploying that solution inside of the platform. So uh, beginning June 18th, we will have private sandbox environments for people to demo. They can either use sample data or they can uh, actually allow us to migrate some one client's information from a from an existing platform so they can actually see what their information would look like in the platform. Um, okay. In the in between now and then, we can definitely set up some some demo times and allow people to take a look at it. And if anybody's does want to have some YouTube videos, we do have a YouTube channel with lots of videos on there as to the functions and features of the platform. It's going to be a public launch on uh, July 3rd of this year. So we're, okay. we're going to be going to conference. We have uh, a bunch of early access folks that are uh, getting onboarded as we speak. And uh, then in July 3rd, it'll be open to the public at large, if you will, into the professional space that is. Right. Okay. Well, fantastic. Well, we will definitely see you cool. at on New Heights. We will be there. Yeah, look forward to it. 25th through the 29th. I think I fly out on 29th. So we will uh, certainly uh, try to break bread or a cup of coffee or maybe even have that cocktail. So uh, happy to be the, I'll, I'll buy it. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Well, very right. good. Well, I appreciate your time. Thanks for joining me Thanks, on the, on the uh, podcast today and we will see you very soon. Thanks. All right. Very good. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.